Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Tom Thornton, and I'm the Dean of Arts and Sciences here at University of Alaska Southeast. And normally I would be greeting you from our beautiful Egan Library on campus. But as we know, this is uh, unusual times. And in the COVID pandemic, our campus is essentially uh, closed, all but uh, uh, essential classes on campus. And so we've switched most of our events to this virtual environment of Zoom. But I see at least 59 people have joined us. And so I'm really pleased to see that audience uh, tonight. Um, this this uh, presentation will also be recorded and posted online to our YouTube channel. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce our two guests tonight and the program that they re represent, uh, Renewable Juno, which is uh, a 501c3 organization that has been helping to transform uh, people's lives through lower carbon energy, renewable energy, uh, electric cars, heat pumps, and you'll hear all about that tonight. But their plan is actually more ambitious. It's to make Juno Alaska's model city, model city for sustainability. And we'll be hearing about that plan tonight from two of Renewable Juno's board members, uh, John Neary and Kate Troll and uh, a little bit about each of them. Uh, John is retired from a 37 year career with the US Forest Service in Juneau, uh, first as a wilderness manager and then as the Mendenhall Glacier Visitor Center Director. Uh, he's also a returned Peace Corps volunteer and consultant experienced with African countries uh, in managing parks and tourism. Uh, he also has hobbies, it loves biking uh, everywhere, skiing uphill and soaking up the heat from his masonry fireplace and uh, I suspect from his uh, heat pump as well, right? Uh, no, no, just the fireplace. The fireplace, <laughs> okay. Heat pump's not hot enough, is that right? right. And uh, also we have with us Kate Troll, who's uh, I know been a guest before at Evening in Egan. And Kate is currently an op-ed columnist and speaker on conservation and climate issues. Uh, she's retired from a career in natural resource management, wherein she dedicated 22 years to fisheries, timber, climate, and energy policy. Uh, Kate was appointed by Governor Sarah Palin to serve on the Alaska Climate Mitigation Advisory Board. And also, and here's a fact I didn't know, the only invited participant, or the only Alaskan invited participant, rather, in Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger's 2008 Global Climate Summit. Uh, as Executive Director of Alaska's Conservation Voters, Kate helped draft the creation of uh, the uh, Alaska Renewable Energy Fund and lobbied for the Sustainable Energy Act, uh, a comprehensive roadmap to generate 50% of Alaska's electrical energy from renewable sources by 2025. Who are the people yeah, which she was elected to public office twice, uh, both to the Juneau Douglas Borough and also to the Ketchikan Borough Assembly. Uh, prior to serving on the board of Renewable Juneau, Kate served for five years on the board of directors for the Renewable Energy Alaska Project, also known as REAP. And uh, I'll just add a note for, from UAS's perspective. Renewable Juno has certainly been an inspiration for us on our campus and helping us move towards our sustainability goals. And uh, our faculty senate uh, just this year in January passed a resolution on sustainability, which encouraged uh, a partnership with Renewable Juno and to take uh, or follow, from, take from their example and follow their example, maybe through partnership of uh, pursuing carbon offsetting um, through a mechanism we already have, our own travel system, and then putting that into uh, to further advancing renewable energy on our own campus uh, and or to, uh, to uh, renewable uh, Juno's own carbon offset program, which actually benefits low income uh, families in their transition towards uh, lower carbon and renewable energy. So I'm very pleased to introduce our two speakers. I think they will split the duties. And uh, John, you're going first. Uh, and I think collectively, they will speak for about 40 minutes. We'll try to leave about 20 minutes for questions. Uh, because of the mute, mute and unmute process with questions, 
We really encourage people to put questions in the chat box, which you should see on your screen. But if you can't figure that out or you're more comfortable speaking, we will have a process for recognizing you uh, once the presentation is, is finished. But uh, please otherwise hold your questions uh, until the end of the presentation. So John, uh, over to you. Thank you, Tom. I'm going to quickly hand the mic over to Kate. She's going to introduce us in our uh, talk tonight and then I'll be following up right after Kate. So Kate, you wanna take it from here? You bet. So um, we have an ambitious goal in front of us, you know, making Juneau, you know, Alaska's model city of sustainability. And John and I are here tonight uh, to tell you that it's achievable, particularly if the city and community of Juneau get really engaged. And we'll tell you about that toward the end of our talk. But first, I'd like to just sort of talk about, you know, why push for sustainability? Why Juneau? And what does a model of sustainability look like? So for many of the people online here and those that listen into Evening at Egan, you probably realize that the, one of the primary reasons to push for sustainability is climate change, the climate crisis that we have in front of us. Uh, we all know that it's all hands on deck, that we need engagement from the federal, state, local businesses, and the individuals. So that's you know, one very important reason that strikes me in, in, in my heart chords about why push for sustainability. The second reason is that it is to promote jobs and the economy. Putting emphasis on the clean energy jobs in the clean energy economy actually creates jobs. You might be surprised to learn that in America right now, the number of people employed in clean energy jobs equals the number of school teachers across America. The number of Americans employed in energy efficiency jobs equals the numbers of servers in bars and restaurants. But mind you, that was a, a pre-COVID statistic there. But the point I'm trying to make is that pushing for sustainability, it's good for the environment and it's good for the economy, goes hand in hand. So that's a big reason why we, we want to get you excited about this particular vision we have. And then why Juno? Why should we be the model city? Well, we are the only major city that is powered by clean, fish-friendly hydro. Uh, Anchorage, there's, they have some uh, windmills on Fire Island and they're starting to promote solar, but still over 80% of their electricity comes from, fossil, from natural gas. And in Fairbanks, they rely on diesel and coal for their electricity. So we, we've got that going for us above any other community in this major community in the state. Uh, secondly, we also have one of the most iconic backdrops for promoting sustainability, and that is the Mendenhall Glacier. Uh, and third uh, reason, and this is a tribute to who Juno is as a community, uh, we have the city and borough of Juneau has been engaged in sustainability discussions since 2007 when they created the Juneau Commission on Sustainability. We have an assembly that has established sustainability as one of their overarching goals. Uh, so we are, as a community and as a city, sort of out there setting the trend. Uh, another thing we have going for us is we have one of the highest adoption rates of electric vehicles in the nation. So. You'll hear more about that as we go on. Uh, many of you may not realize that we also have the only federal facility that is carbon neutral, and that is the Ted Stevens NOAA facility out at Lena Point. And the last reason why I think why Juno is probably apparent to many of you online here is that, well, we are the capital city after all. So um, Juno, I think, is primed to be the model of sustainability. And the next question I wanted to kind of approach here is, well, what does this vision of sustainability look like? And for those of us that have been involved in local issues here and talking about uh, renewable energy and the Juno Renewable Energy Strategy, um, a big vision of what it looks like is, is we would have a world-class seawater heat pump district heating system in downtown Juno. We'd have an electric bus transit system We'd have a very high proportion of electric vehicles. 
we have a very would have a very high proportion of our buildings heated by heat pumps. We have cruise ships that don't have to run diesel generators while they're parked downtown. And we'd have our local mines on, on hydropower instead of burning diesel. Uh, these are bold steps, but we think that th they're achievable. And this is the model that we think Gino can, can benefit from. And the next segment I wanna kind of go into is, well, what do we mean by beneficial el electrification? And we have a short video to show to you on that. It gives you a good definition of why we are pushing the electrification of Juno in many ways. Okay, great. So I'm going to, I imagine people are seeing now the slide deck start, the title slide, is that correct? Okay, great. I'm sharing my desktop and I'll be sort of running this and uh, start to move through it here. Wanted to make a quick note before we get to that. Uh, video about who Renewable Juno is and what we do. So I'm a board member, have been for a little over a year, uh, Kate a little bit longer, and we have several other board members that are all volunteer, all Juno residents, really interested in seeing a clean and prosperous future for Juno. Uh, we're really focused in on, in on energy, renewable energy specifically, right? So we advocate for renewable energy. Um, a lot of that is with our CBJ, our city. Uh, we like to educate through heat pump workshops. We've conducted these annually. Uh, one happened just on Wednesday. Maybe some of you were able to take that in. Uh, Angela, Steve, Doug uh, did that through the Renewable Energy Alaska Project. Uh, and then administering the Juno Carbon Offset Fund, which is that symbol on your lower right side there. Uh, this is what Tom mentioned, where people contribute offsets for their travel. Maybe it's their jet flight to Seattle and beyond, whatever. And those contributions become um, part of a purchase of a heat pump for a low-income family in Juneau. So we hit the, the triple bottom line of environmental justice, social justice, economic. And the heat pumps are installed by contractors and we partner with Steve J also to form Alaska Heat Smart. AEL and P and others are also part of that. Alaska Heat Smart is essentially, you could look at that, uh, a consultant if you don't meet the qualifications for a low income family, but you still want a heat pump, you should be talking to Alaska Heat Smart. So, just what's this electrification all about of Juno? We, we've had electricity for a lot of years here, right? And you heard Kate talk about the fact that it's clean hydro, it's fish friendly hydro. So what does that look like in terms of sustainability? We've got a little video, a two minute video, that gives you this uh, concept of beneficial electrification. Let's see how, how they describe it. I'll start up the video here. What is beneficial electrification? Electricity is an important part of almost everything we do. And we often take for granted how central it is to our quality of life. Thanks to past electrification efforts, the benefits of electricity reach nearly all Americans. So if electrification has already happened in the past, why are we talking about beneficial electrification now? It's because large groups of stakeholders are realizing more and more benefits as new electric products help consumers save money, become more convenient, and as electricity becomes cleaner and greener. For consumers, electric products can be fun and exciting, like electric vehicles, can offer convenience like smart homes and can save money due to the incredible energy efficiency of new products like advanced electric water heaters and heat pumps that heat and cool homes. The use of electricity is also an essential strategy for reducing carbon dioxide emissions associated with climate change. The emissions resulting from the generation of electricity have already declined by 29% and it keeps getting better. This means that every single device that uses electricity has gotten better for the environment over time, just by being plugged into the electric grid as electricity gets greener. For utilities, beneficial electrification provides an important opportunity to engage consumers, deliver more services, and help the environment. A win-win-win scenario. What is beneficial electrification? Electrification provides many benefits that are well known. Different stakeholders throughout communities bring different perspectives of how electrification benefits them. 
Through a broad coalition, we have established a description of beneficial electrification that a wide group of stakeholders can agree on. If electrifying an end use satisfies at least one of these conditions without adversely affecting the others, it is clearly beneficial. There are abundant opportunities for beneficial electrification, and you can be part of this exciting effort. We hope you can join us in our mission to promote beneficial electrification. Learn more at www.beneficialelectrification.com. Okay, so ending the video there and moving on. Okay, uh, John, can you go to the next slide that shows about our energy? So um, what many people on this chat tonight need to be aware of is that in 2018, the assembly adopted the Juno Renewable Energy Strategy, and it set a goal to have 80% of our energy sources come from renewable energy by 2045. And this is a good snapshot of what that challenge is. We, we were just talking about uh, the benefits of hydro, but that's only 20% of our energy source. Over 70, as you can see on this chart, 77% of our energy comes from fossil fuels. And that is spent in buildings and in transport, um, in infrastructure, these are places that we really need to make a difference. So, you know, to get to, get to that 80% renewable energy goal, it, it's a big lift. Uh, but, but we think, you know, uh, it's achievable and with a very concerted effort to try to push more beneficial electrification, we think we can get there. And the next segment of this talk, we kind of want to go into the details of, of what that looks like. But I think the next slide, John, go ahead. This one shows you a little bit more of a close up of that fossil fuel component and how much of our fuel is used toward transportation versus jet fuel versus marine transportation. So it gives this a little bit more of a snapshot of where we need to make some focus in, in our efforts to electrify the rest of Juno. Uh, so next, we're going to go into some of the details, uh, the components of that vision that I spoke about earlier, and I'm going to pass on over to John at this point. So you can see that transportation, if you add up those three slices of the pie, comes up to 43% uh, of our energy picture here in Juneau. And that's largely due to the cars that you and I drive, the trucks that are running around town, a bit of jet fuel and marine uh, fuel as well. But this is something that we have already seen in Juneau could be a low hanging fruit for conversion. So um, I'd like to start just by taking a step back off that and talking a little bit about what Kate mentioned early in the talk, the Mendenhall Glacier, our iconic backdrop for Juneau, which as we all know is shrinking away. It's disappearing from view. Estimates are the visitors from the visitor center, you won't see that glacier in, in just another 30 years or so. The Forest Service is um, forming an ambitious plan to reshape all of the facilities at that glacier visitor center. And as part of that vision, they are uh, proposing at this point a very large parking lot to park all the buses that need to come there because currently there is there is a traffic jam uh, during the summer. No, not this summer, as you know, because we had no cruise ships, but the summer previous certainly was, and future summers, well, we'll find out. But um, one of the things that we have seen with this proposal is that it really is last century thinking for this visitor center, when what we really need is next century thinking. And next century looks a bit different or could look a bit different. This is a large parking lot that's proposed. For example, if you can see my cursor, if people are seeing that, this is where that kettle pond is that would be completely buried under rock and asphalt and a steep creek over here, the salmon stream, you know, could certainly be affected by this amount of development. So I personally am not a supporter of this, nor are a lot of people. And there are alternatives, like a circulator, an electric circulator moving perhaps the vo largest volume of people that are visiting from at the end of the road there, the Glacier Spur Road, where it, where it um, first begins down that road to the visitor center. It could like, look like this, 
with the kettle pond still in place and uh, maybe a lot saner in terms of the traffic scenario. And that could be electric. And then what it might also allow a scenario like this would be um, electric buses to deliver the people from the docks to the glacier. It could look something like this. Now this bus is a depiction of one that was brought to Juneau by Alaska Coach Tours several years ago to demonstrate to people what the technology looks like. And it looks great to me. <laughs> it looks like something that's going to have no pollution, no um, emissions out of the pipe that are choking people standing nearby on the sidewalk. Um, and then perhaps most of all, the actual act of getting on this bus and moving from the dock to the glacier doesn't contribute anything to the reason why the glacier is melting away from view. So there's a nice sync between your actions and your effects while you visit this iconic glacier. So electric buses are something that I strongly promoted at the visitor center when I was the director there, but at the same time found very little progress, uh, primarily because what you're looking at is a, uh, a bus that costs over $800,000. And if you could instead, as a uh, tour coach company, get a $100,000 bus used or move one from another part of your operation up in Fairbanks to Juneau at a much lower rate. And if your season is only four or five months long, it's really hard to justify that kind of capital investment. So um, we've seen the adoption of electric buses like this at zero in Juneau uh, by the tour companies. But we also have seen recently that the city of Juneau has been successful at getting grants. We're going to see our first electric transit bus in Juneau sometime in December, we think, in Juneau. Um, and then also recently the city has qualified for six additional buses. So one crazy idea would be for the city to run the bus fleet from the dock to the glacier with those great transit buses. Why not? because along the way you can bring both residents and tourists on their destination. The reason why it makes sense is because ridership would be high. It would, it would really allow capital transit to see the benefits of such a scenario from ridership fares alone, helping to subsidize, subsidize the year round operation. Um, clean transit, of course, with buses like this, instead of the ones belching the smoke. Regular operations, if we had a big enough fleet of all 15 or so Juno buses, that were moving around Juneau um, and some of them coming to the glacier and others obviously going to other destinations like Off Bay and you know, downtown Douglas, et cetera. But um, there would be great clean options for moving people around. It still doesn't solve the congestion problem downtown, right? That's, that's still an issue that persists. But at the same time, it would certainly solve the congestion problem at the glacier and we wouldn't see the need for that big parking lot. It would be a much saner scenario where, um, oops, um, let me go back using that arrow, where something like this would be um, what you'd be looking at from, from your arrival um, at the glacier. So electric buses are possible. In fact, they're already coming. How to use them is part of a public discussion. Um, we would look to the city manager to provide some leadership. He's already mentioned that this could be a potential. Uh, we would look to the assembly to help lobby for this, to, to see how that might happen. Because again, CBJ qualifies for the federal grants from Department of Energy that a private tour company can't. So it brings down the cost of that bus to something very affordable and good for the city, good for the visitor. If we're going to be a model city, let's make our introduction to our city not on a diesel bus where everybody's choking over the fumes. Now this links of course and segues nicely to that other part of our transit system, which is our individual cars. And as you can see from this photo taken of this year's roundup of electric vehicles, um, Juno has a pretty high adoption rate for these vehicles. In Alaska, outside of Juno, we have a total in the state of 628 vehicles, which is about one per 1,150. 15 Alaskan residents. Nationally, it's a higher rate of adoption, you know, 1.6 million 
EVs nationally, probably most of those are in California, but that comes to one EV per 206 residents. Now look at the figure for Juno on the bottom there. Juno has 418 electric vehicles. That's one per every 76 residents in Juno. And that's what Kate was referring to with this really high per capita adoption. Some of that can be explained by Juno's lack of roads, right? We don't have the range anxiety that you do in the rest of Alaska or certainly the rest of the US. That's great. We have low temperatures of our, for our air temperatures, which are great for batteries um, and the preservation. But there's a lot to be said for people who just really want to do the right thing with their electric vehicle. And, um, you know, despite initial costs of electric vehicles being high, those prices have been coming down like 7% per year as battery technology has increased. So at this point, it makes sense for your bottom line of your household, because you're probably going to save about $1,000 per year on fuel and other maintenance costs if you have an EV versus a combustion engine vehicle. Much of those savings for our environment come from the fact that an electric motor is way more efficient at converting fuel to the power in the wheels. That's really what it comes down to. These EVs are more efficient. Another low hanging fruit, which we really would love to emphasize here is simply saving the money we're already spending, basically conserving what's already out there. It doesn't have to be in, involving building new supplies or we don't even have to think necessarily about heat pumps saving all of this energy if we can't afford the heat pump, even though we think it's still a great idea for those who can, but you can save a lot of money simply by weatherizing your door. Look at that photo in the lower right of the screen here. Look at the blue line that surrounds the door. So that is taken with an infrared camera from the inside of the house and the blue means cold and there's a vent there and there's a weather stripping idea. Those things are big heat losses for this home. And the amount of cold air moving in to the home is really affecting how much the heater has to compensate for, how much fuel oil is being burnt there. So weather stripping. And the real bottom line here is hire a professional to help you or have Alaska Heat Smart come in or you know, whatever program you can use to get advice on where your money will be best spent in your home or if it's your business, in your building, even your warehouses, that big garage door, weather stripping around there. There's so many ways to save heat. Look at this uh, chart in the upper left. Space heating is the biggest component of building energy efficiency. If we can save uh, on this kind of air infiltration and such, will really affect that 45% of your home or your business um, spending on just space heating alone. Water heating is another big component. And uh, an electric water heater is most efficient in Juneau. And uh, there are heat pump water heaters also, which you can increase your efficiency rates and lower your annual costs. So those are just a couple of things. Uh, cooling isn't the big issue in Juneau. So that piece of the pie isn't really a big part of it, but uh, really space heating is what it comes down to in the far north. The next component that I wanna to talk to you about is uh, putting the mines on hydro, as Kate mentioned. Uh, Greens Creek Mine currently uses 75,000 um, megawatt hours of, of power per year. That is a lot of power. They are an interruptible customer of AELMP. If you know what that means, it means that in a year when the reservoirs are full, like we had, say, this past summer, then Greens Creek can benefit from the power line that hooks AELMP's power to the mine. And they can purchase power from AELMP, and that helps all of us in Juneau with our lowering our bills, because the more they purchase, the more that uh, uh, power cost equalization doesn't have to be applied, which is the increase in our power bills. So that helps us, but it also helps the environment in a big way, doesn't it? Because when they don't get the hookup or they don't get a chance to, to use eight gallon power, they're burning their own diesel. Now the mine would love to burn, uh, to, to not burn diesel. It would stabilize their, their own microgrid. It would allow them all kinds of options that consistency would, would be best for them. But AELMP doesn't have the capacity to provide that, especially in a low water year like we saw in 2019, where Greens Creek didn't get much power at all. 
Now compare that use, 75,000, to what Princess used all summer, just 6,000 megawatt hours. Uh, you can see the scale here is really important, not to diminish the fact that the cruise ships are a target for us, because when you multiply the fact that well, Princess is just one dock and we have five docks, um, that still is a pretty big component of the overall picture. So this is where I'm going to segue to uh, Kate, and she's going to talk a little bit about heat pumps and dock electrification. All right. Thank you, John, for that. So moving on to heat pumps, it's important to realize that there are indeed three types of heat pumps. The first being the ground source heat pumps. And here in Juneau, we actually were a pioneer in putting uh, ground source heat pumps into the airport. And based on those savings, uh, when the Valley Pool went in, when the Valley Library went in, uh, ground source heat pumps were installed at their construction sites. We also have, uh, you know, ground source heat pumps. You can't just like decide to remodel and, t oh, let's just put one in. I mean, it's a major construction project. So when Foodland and Tyler Rental went under, you know, major reconstruction, they too also put in a ground source heat pump. So, you know, as far as having commercial facilities and public facilities using these heat pumps, we're, we're right there with the best of them. Um, the, the next type of heat pump is a water source heat pump, and this is where it extracts heat from a water source. And we currently have had one very bold proposal to create the Juneau District Heating District, which would take heat from Gastineau Channel using a, a, a seawater heat pump and through a, a distribution system of pipes, basically, you know, have a central district heating downtown, which would include like the state office building and, and the legislature and those buildings all connected to one source of heat. And, and district heating, it's not a new idea. In fact, in Scandinavia, it's used throughout the country. It's, it's, it's dominant source of there being a connected way of heating buildings. Um, here in the United States, we have about 2,500 district heating units, but they all rely on D Can you hear me? I'm hearing you. Is everybody else hearing you? Okay, I see a lot of head shaking up and down. Oh, she was there and now she's not. How about now? Now you're back. Okay. All right. Well, I don't know where people got lost off. So I'm going to start with the water source heat pump in the Juneau district heating. No, I think you had that one pretty good. You, you okay. That. Okay, good. All right. All right. But the point I really want to make is that uh, this is where Juneau gets really put on the, the map nationally, because if we went forward with the proposal to create a seawater heat pump system downtown, it would be the first in the nation that was deriving it from a carbon neutral source. It's, it's basically growing the experience at the Lena Point NOAA facility, you know, by a magnitude of 10. But it, it would be cutting edge because it would be the first that was based on seawater and be carbon neutral. Uh, and in 2018, when I was on assembly, um, or thereabouts, uh, the Juno Assembly actually supported this project along with uh, Sweetheart Lake. So we sent in a letter of support for this project. So something we, st we would still like to see happen. Um, the third type of heat pump are our air source heat pumps. And this is the model that is typically used throughout uh, the residential sector. As it notes here, it's a very simple and least expensive model to be used. And right now we have about 400 of, of air source heat pumps put into residential and commercial buildings throughout uh, Juneau, most of it being residential. And we've had a lot of growth in this, thankful to our partnerships with Plinka Haida and Regional Housing, Alaska Heat Smart, University of Alaska Southeast, and our Juneau Carbon Offset Program. And part of the reason why we've seen such strong growth is the fact that homeowners 
on average are reducing their heating bills by 40 to 70 percent. And they find that this, this simple design right here, these mini split ductless systems, they can pretty much pay for themselves in four to six years. Um, the other advantage of air source heat pumps is that they, they clean the indoor air and most importantly, they reduce those greenhouse gas emissions. Remember that slice of the pie that was a big chunk of our residential heating? Air source heat pumps is the number one way to reduce those, those types of emissions. Um, according to an analysis that Stuart Cohen with the Interfaith Power and Light, he did, he, he found, kind of went through all the borough documents and determined that there are about 8,900 residential candidates for air source heat pumps. So at our current rate, that would take 20 years to do, but we want to accelerate that. You know, we want to promote um, on bill financing. We, we really want to try and, and you know, we're, we're doubling every year or so, but we really want to continue escalating on that curve and creating more air source heat pumps. Um, the next topic that I want to kind of look into a little bit is dock electrification. And this slide shows one of the very compelling reasons as to why many people in the community want us to plug in the docks to shoreside power, and that is to eliminate the downtown haze, the pollution. And in, in 2020, the assembly, as part of their uh, overarching goal of promoting sustainability, identified one of their action items was to, to implement uh, dock electrification. And I, I remember in 2014, this is when the discussion first came up and you know we wanted to try to explore these opportunities of shoreside power. Can you go to the next slide? Yep. And this kind of shows you the configuration of our downtown 16B docks. Um, and the, the, it gives you an overview of some of the engineering aspects of dock electrification. Um, and right now, because it is a priority. It's being looked at. So we have the Docks and Harbors uh, Commission looking into this, but because we have a supply problem, as was alluded to earlier by John with the, with the mines, because these would be interruptible customers, we, we now have the Docks and Harbors program looking into a, a rate analysis between firm and interruptible consumers. And, and if this is a problem that has kind of has a recurring theme. Um, but before I move on to that, I also want to emphasize that there is interest in the industry to go in this direction. Um, this is an amazing image here of how thick <laughs> those cords are. But the industry, cruise ship industry, has a desire to plug in because they want to promote their green actions to their, to their clients. So we see a need here in Juno to reduce the pollution, to reduce the greenhouse gas, and to meet the needs of industry. But it doesn't go very far because it kind of gets bogged down into the situation of supply. And that leads into our third segment where John and I kind of want to talk about some of the supply and the challenges that we have uh, because while the issue of adequate supply is now before the Docks and Harbors Commission, we've, we've seen it on, on the mines. But at the same time, we have um, Sweetheart Lake, which has been approved by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, for four years now. Uh, and they've got all their permits, it's shovel ready to go but they need an interconnection agreement with ALMP or Avista, which is our, the owner of our local private utility. And uh, they haven't been able to get that. And it's normally those interconnection agreements take about a year or so. So uh, for us in Renewable Juno, uh, you know, we're, we're happy to get more hydropower, whether it comes from Sweetheart Lake or Dorothy Lake too. But here's a graph from the renewable energy strategy that shows you that if we want to go 
into the vision that John and I have been talking about. We want to have our docks electrified, our mines on hydro. We want to increase the rate of heat pump conversions. We're going to need more supply. Uh, we need Sweetheart Lake and we need uh, you know, Dorothy Lake too. Sweetheart Lake would add about 20% capacity right now and we would be able to go ahead and meet the needs and electrify our docks and meet the needs of our mines if we had an interconnection agreement. And this is where I kind of want to segue and give you a little bit of you know, inside utility, inside baseball talk. In that earlier where I was talking about how unique Juno is in, in terms of positioning us to be a model of sustainability, we have one very unique obstacle in that we are the only major city in Alaska that derives its electricity from a private utility, a private investor. Most of the, all the other utilities in the state are either municipal utilities, uh, I mean, I'm talking about major ones, they're sure little smaller pocket ones, but, or they are public private cooperatives. And, and they have a process whereby the public is engaged in looking at what's called integrated resource planning or going back to another term, integrated electrification. And what this means is where you're matching up, you're looking ahead and saying, what are the demands? What does the community want to be? And, and what are those needs for electricity and matching those needs of demand with supply? And that's the integration, demand with supply. And normally there is a public process. You have an access for a public point of view. You have on a cooperative, you have board members that are elected from the public that serve on the board. Uh, we, don't, we don't have that here. So essentially any type of integrated community-based planning is left up to ALMP Avista. Uh, we also, here in Alaska, there are oversight regular uh, agency is a regulatory commission of Alaska. And by comparison to other states, it's, it's very weak. It's pretty much delegated to just overseeing proposals on rate increases based on infrastructure that's already been built. It's not forward thinking. Um, Avista, that is the owner of our electricity, also owns you know, electricity in, in uh, Washington, Idaho, and Oregon, and, and has communities. Where there, they have a stronger oversight commission. And they are required in their integrated resource planning to have a public comment period. They are, uh, and they also, Avista offers them, they have a technical advisory committee that has stakeholders, members of the public there. We in Juno don't have that. So uh, that is our conundrum and we don't have a public access point or public, strong public oversight. Uh, so uh, it's really left up to our utility and, but we really wanna make the case that it's really left up to the city and borough of Juneau. We really want them to get engaged and promote a community-based integrated electrification plan for Juno because we think if we look long term and you see everything that needs to be done to get us to that 80% goal of renewable energy by 2045, we need to have the community buy-in to this vision and, 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 and to assert themselves and say, we want to have an integrated electrification planning process. We know we're unique. Um, we appreciate all that ALMP and Avista has done, particularly ALMP over 100 years in giving us low price, stable electricity, but we also want to move into the future. And, and, and there's no reason why we should be sitting here four years out with a FERC approved project, um, not really moving ahead, not creating those jobs uh, that we had talked about earlier for construction and everything. So. Um, I've kind of led into that, but I wanted us to get back to, you know, the, 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 the total vision of what John and I and members of Renewable Juno want to convey is, you know, we think that Juno can be really setting the stage in, in so many exciting ways. Um, so 
Uh, John, you want to do the last, I'm going to hand off to you for this last slide since you put it together. Right, and, and basically what I love about being a board member for Renewable Juno is that we really want to advocate for renewable energy for the entire community. And it, it really doesn't matter whether you're from the red tribe or the blue tribe or who gets elected or doesn't, because what we've seen with renewable energy is it has people from all across the political spectrum who want either the bottom economic bottom line um, to be in their favor or want to save the earth from too warm a climate, wherever in between you find yourselves, you can find ways to support things like electric vehicles and buses, heat pumps and heating efficiency of homes. Um, and of course the mines would, would um, really help the, both the environment as well as job production, business bottom lines, the cruise ship docks. So we really want to urge you to contact your assembly members to tell them that you feel that this is important, to show up to meetings. If we do in fact have an integrated community plan to show up and, and share your piece, uh, your vision for how Juno uh, could make this happen to really uh, provide a lot of beneficial electrification for our future. So that's really our summary point. Uh, if do you have anything else to add, uh, Kate, before we move into question and answer? Um, I, I just would like to remind people that we really believe that we can achieve these goals because we think of Juno uh, community members as being resilient, visionary, and after all, we are the capital city. So let's come together for some community planning on electrification and move forward for this vision. Thank you very much, John. And, and Kate, that was excellent. And uh, you've left plenty of time for questions. Uh, maybe I'll start by uh, placing a few that are in the chat box. There was one regarding uh, geothermal energy. And I guess they said is, is, is the heat pump that you discussed, I think it's tidal based. Is that uh, such a system as China Hot Springs? Is it a type of water source heat, heat pump? So sort of factual question from Kelsey. That's an interesting question, Kelsey. I remember when I first heard about geothermal, I thought the same thing. It's like, it's like Iceland, right? Hot water just gifted to you from mother nature. Um, but no, it's not in Juneau because we don't, we're not Iceland. Um, but we do have warmer temperatures in the earth than we do in the atmosphere all winter long. And the same with our salt water just slightly warmer temperatures than our atmosphere. And it's that difference between those two relative temperatures that makes a heat pump efficient. So NOAA out here at Lena, they extract a bit of heat from the ocean around Lena Point and make that uh, compressed and pumped through the building to, to heat the building. Uh, that's what geothermal is. Uh, that, that's a saltwater heat pump, but geothermal is the same thing. If you put loops in the ground or wells deep, like under our airport asphalt. Great, and uh, let me pose another one from Lynn Davis. Is there any interest or possibility in a public hydro company rather than for-profit with CBJ at the hub? <laughs> okay, I guess I'll take this one then, you know. Um, No, okay. Uh, there was some time ago when uh, the city and borough assembly of Juno, you know, thought about you know, th there was a potential to be able to purchase ALMP, and and they, and they opted not to. Um, and you know that option might come around again when the Snedisham bonds are are due, but that's it's kind of out there at least another 10, 15 years, I believe. Maybe there's somebody else here online who, who knows more the particulars about that. Um, but I, I, I personally think that when the opportunity arises, it's something that the assembly should consider doing because um, you know, a lot of municipalities, they don't control an airport, they don't control their, their hospital, but they, they generally run their, their energy system because it's, it's just so integral to public works and infrastructure and everything else. So just from the, you know, 
systems network, it makes sense to do it. But many times also, uh, you know, this, 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 it becomes a revenue source for the municipality. So I think there's lots of merit to doing that, but the, the time right, it's not ripe right now. Great, thank you. And I'll add one more from the chat box from Peggy Cowan. Uh, the chart showed 17% of fossil fuels for electricity. Uh, does our electricity come from oil all the time or only when the hydro fails? It really is when the hydro fails, Peggy. It's uh, as AELNP has said many times, Juno is 100% hydro 99% of the time. So it's, it's about when the, uh, they can't supply because of a line failure between Snedisham and Juno or you know, other, other problems with connections and such. Or and sometimes it's just because they can't meet the, the firm customer demand um, and they have to fire up those diesel generators to, to, to get up to capacity. For example, that would be in a year like we had in 2019 where the water levels were so low, but the demand was still there. And maybe we'll, we'll switch over to some live questions. I can't see people's hands, so I don't know if you can, Gloria, but uh, um, perhaps I can pose one while others are gathering thoughts. Um, you've talked a lot about the transition in energy generation uh, to renewable sources, but in an integrated energy plan and a just transition towards sustainability, where does demand fit in uh, and demand management as opposed to just supply? Are we using too much energy? How, uh, how can a just transition make, uh, maybe uh, contain our demand a little bit or should we not be looking at that direction? I'll start and maybe Kate, you can add some too. But remember that image I showed of space heating in homes and the blue line around the door and coming in the vent. Um, it's a huge part of Juno's energy picture because we're in a Northern climate with cold winters. We lose a lot of our energy out our windows, our doors, through our you know, plumbing connections, through the floors, coming in the attics and places that aren't closed off. So getting the help of an energy professional to come in and flash that infrared camera around, do a blower door test, tell you what the air exchanges in your home are and what they should be, that would save huge amounts of energy without any increase in supply necessary. And if we could continue to shift that direction, as well as shifting from, um, you know, the heat pump from, especially if it were moving from a resistance electric heater to a heat pump, that would save Juno's hydro energy for, uh, supply needs uh, to a large degree. But even moving from fossil fuels to a heat pump uh, then saves the overall energy picture and, and helps us with our greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, and I'd, I'd like to add, um from my perspective when I was serving on the board of the Renewable Energy Alaska Project, uh, Chris Rose, the executive director of that organization, he estimated that statewide, uh, we spend about five billion a year uh, energizing our state in terms of homes, buildings, cars, transport, the whole, the whole mix. And he estimates that about 20% of that is waste. It's energy that we're burning. Um, because of lack of energy efficiency projects, of recapture, of, of, of trying to diminish our demand. So, uh, you know, on a statewide level, if we had a really robust program that funded energy efficiency projects, we would create thousands of jobs and, and get those $1 billion that's going up the smokestack, we'd get that recirculating. Uh, and Juno can certainly be a big part of that. We, we still have that need as demonstrated by the home heating slides that, that John has done. Um, so I always think that, I mean, the cheapest uh, renewable energy is the energy you don't burn. That's, that's a truism throughout all this. But that said, uh, what, if we really want to move that needle on 80% renewable energy by 2045, we really has to, we have to boost electrical demand in the city. We have to transfer our tra more of our home heating to electric. We have to transfer more of our transport system to electric, the docks to electric, et cetera. Thank you, Kate. And I appreciate your remarks uh, with the fact you're wearing a warm sweater. 
uh, indoor. <laughs> Another way to reduce demand, I suppose. Um, all right, so should we open it up to uh, other questions? And I guess people can unmute themselves. Is that what we're suggesting, Gloria? Yeah, um, I can't unmute them. They have to unmute themselves. All right, so liberate yourselves, questioners. And uh, we have time for at least five more. Looks like Glenn has a question. Hi, I was wondering if there's a strong interface with the oversight groups of Avista and the other states. No, there isn't. Uh, uh, to my knowledge, uh, there's no communication that happens uh, between those communities and, and Juno and the other Avista utilities. I mean, um, you know, ALMP is also managed by a separate subsidiary within Avista. Even though Avista is the overall owner, we, we do have local management and we have a different utilities oversight commission than the other states. Uh, so we're, we are very much a different animal. Um, I think when uh, uh, Avista was looking to uh, be bought out by Hydro One, maybe there was some communication uh, with those communities and those commissions at that time. But that's all I've been aware of. Okay, have time for one or two more. Just see a note from uh, Andy, who reminds me that yes. we in Juneau just passed the $15 million bond package as part of this recent city election, of which uh, about a third is going to go to energy efficiencies within the city government. So thanks for that reminder, Andy. And let's put that to some of these same things we're talking about. Let's put it towards building efficiencies. Let's save the city money. Let's save Juno's um, bottom line with wise investments in schools and in uh, whatever public utility uh, buildings that we have in the city. All right, any other questions? One, one uh, question I might follow up on demand. Uh, I mean, ultimately demand is, is about consumption and you can increase energy efficiency, but then you sometimes run into what's called Jevons paradox or the rebound effect, right? People save a certain amount on, on their energy bill, but they'll use that to consume uh, other products that maybe have to be shipped through Amazon or something else. And so uh, it may just transfer the energy footprint or the energy demand to other sources. Uh, how do you deal with that problem? What, what we would like to see them shifted towards if they're saving money on their new heat pump. We just had this recent discussion with the Board of Renewable Juno. If, uh, if they're saving a thousand bucks a year, um, let's say, or maybe it's a bit less than that uh, on their heat pump, could they spend some of that on weatherizing the doors? Could they plug up some of the holes in the floor where the plumbing passes through? Because they Could they add insulation to the attic? Uh, some of that low hanging fruit that will even further help the home be more efficient. And then when you look at affordable housing in Juneau, we've seen this problem for a long time, haven't we? That there's not enough housing stock in Juneau at the low end for first for entry level uh, buyers for our young people and for families that don't have the means. And a lot of that housing stock is not in great shape. You know, it, it is uh, very old. Juneau has older housing stock than most other, other Alaskan communities. And it tends to have the leaky floors and the, the single pane windows or leaky whatever and uh, very expensive to heat. So that, that's what we'd like to see that, that paradox result in not more Amazon shipments. Right. right. Okay, there's one more uh, question uh, from Wallace Stats and we might end on this one. Uh, when there are known plans of community development such as the second housing first project or development by private contractors, does Renewable Juno or Alaska Heat Smart contract contractors to discuss the use of heat pumps in the building of new homes or buildings to educate uh, the contractors and developers of city projects? Go ahead, John. Yes, so we recently had a board retreat with Renewable Juno, and this was actually right on our list, was to do this kind of thing, to do more advocacy with um, real estate agents, contractors, 
just uh, raising the awareness of heat pump efficiency, trying to make more make it more marketable so that homes could be easier sold if people knew that they were um, very efficient, well insulated, operated uh, costs were very low. Of course, part of that comes from just having the actual cost of the heat pumps very affordable the way they have become recently. That's really driving the demand. Even with fossil fuel prices as low as we've seen them, they're really artificially depressed right now, but heat pump adoption is quite high. It's, it's really trending now in Juneau, so that's a good sign. And we want to continue that kind of advocacy. Um, but, you know, but, but backing back up to our main point, we really see that the city could be the leader in this with their own infrastructure, their own buildings, and then the assembly could work with our um, utility to advocate for this integrated community electrification plan we're talking about to try to really push this forward. That, that kind of big community advocacy is what we really need to, to reach that 80%. And is the skilled labor force there to, to implement the strategy? So far it is. It seems to us that we're seeing great um, adoption of electric vehicle without having an electric vehicle dealership. We're seeing pump, uh, heat pump installations by electrical contractors that um, that's a growing part of their business, a really rapidly growing part where they didn't used to uh, be 10 years ago. Um, there are other examples where um, you know, with weatherization professionals, with uh, insulation professionals, um, you, could, you could go down a list, a long list of, of how Juno has the capacity. I just wanted to point out that uh, the Juno School District several years ago uh, worked on their energy efficiency with another uh, company, and we were able to cut our energy use down 28%. A lot and save a couple million dollars. And of course that's reoccurring in our energy costs. But uh, one of the big things about that was was the air ventilation systems and just really watching our energy use and setting our timers better for when things had to go on in the buildings. And I really think we should be doing this as the capital city pushing to have it done on all of our uh, capital city buildings having this energy efficiency um, uh, partnering with a company or if we can do it our own to look at our energy usage across the state and all our uh, state buildings. Thank you, Andy. That's a really good point. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because it is a real life example of how the city already took leadership. It is already seeing savings um, in all kinds of ways. It's a great example. But I'd like to add that I do think the city could do a little bit more. It would be great if there was a person in the city who's and maybe in public works, whose job it was to review the projects that come across just with that energy eye of, of promoting efficiency and, you know, what type of heat system is, is there going to be there. I know the Juno Commission of Sustainability tries to monitor some of the capital improvement projects, but it would be great to have an internal system that's designed to try and, you know, push those energy efficiencies and all the considerations of public facilities. And, and thank you, Andy, for pointing out the school district, because that's one big area. We've had energy audits yeah. done on, yeah. on many of the, the uh, schools here, but we've not acted on those things. Um, you know, it, it would be helpful if we had what's called a green bank um, legislation, since you're not Andy, you know, legislation to establish using some private financing to really jumpstart those few public dollars so that you can put the money into these projects and based on the rate of return that they get on their, on their heating bills. Um, but the schools are really a, a great place to, to put that uh, primary focus. Hey, thank you very much. And I, I appreciate uh, Representative Story's point about schools because that's also an opportunity to increase energy literacy when you do a project that reduces the impact. You can actually study it and understand a little bit about energy. And certainly we all need to be more energy literate uh, in our society because one of the problems is we don't even know what we're using it and how and how much. And uh, But we certainly learned a lot from you two tonight. And I want to thank you very much for your presentation and also for your organization's work in increasing 
uh, public awareness and this and advocating for this mission of uh, transitioning towards sustainability and for Juno to be a model in this area. Uh, thank you very much and thank you all for coming. And I might put a plug in for next week uh, while I've got the floor. Tanya Lewis, a wildlife biologist, will be talking about unraveling the mystery of the glacier bear. So that's uh, mm -hmm. next week at Egan at, Egan at seven o'clock. All right, thank you again and good night. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone.